Welcome to the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are meeting to uh, consider the Bill H-48 that was introduced and referred to our committee earlier today. Uh, this is a bill that, uh, that has had a great deal of time and attention paid to it as uh, we are trying to very quickly get um, some certainty out to our municipal entities about how they can safely uh, attend to their annual meeting business uh, during this pandemic. So um, we are going to meet uh, right now until noon, um, and then we need to break at noon for, uh, for folks to go to caucus and to attend to other duties. Uh, and then we will come back um, as scheduled this afternoon, recognizing that uh, that there may be some uncertainty with the house floor schedule this afternoon. Um, so we wanna try to get through this as quickly as possible. So first I'm gonna ask Tucker Anderson to walk us through the bill. Um, I don't know if you wanna share screen or if you'd like one of us to call up the bill and share screen, or if you just want us to be able to see your, your freshly shorn face. Um, and uh, we appreciate you being with us. Thank you and good morning. Uh, for the record, Tucker Anderson with the Office of Legislative Counsel. I'm gonna share my screen and start by walking through uh, H48 is introduced. And if there's time, we'll move on to some general questions that have come up since the inception of the bill and try to work through some of the general answers. So, Let's test my technological competence here. All right. Uh, the first section of the bill that we're going to move through details the legislative findings, intent, and purpose. This is going to provide some background framework for the operative provisions of the bill and tee up those operative provisions in case there is a need for legislative interpretation around them. Uh, there are two general findings in the bill. First, that the continued spread of COVID-19 has the potential to jeopardize the health and safety of Vermonters who are voting at the 2021 annual municipal meetings. Second, that despite some of the work that this committee, the House and the Senate did together uh, in the fall to pass Act 162, uh, con concerns persist uh, around 2021 annual meetings, uh, in particular, that in municipalities that choose to apply the Australian ballot system to their voting, general law will still require uh, that voters apply for an early absentee ballot or otherwise that the municipality provide polling places. And to refresh everyone's recollection, Act 162 was the act that permitted municipalities to convert through vote of their select board uh, to the Australian ballot system for the 2021 annual meeting. Uh, additionally, there are many municipalities that want to continue their custom of conducting annual meetings using floor votes. The uh, intent here is to protect the health and safety of Vermonters while allowing voters the opportunity to participate in annual meetings. And that second part really tees up why uh, the operative provisions were designed the way they were. Uh, the purpose is first to permit municipalities to move the date of the 2021 annual meeting to a date later in the year. Second, to permit municipalities to mail out 2021 annual meeting early voter ballots to all active registered municipal voters. And third, to authorize the Secretary of State to order or permit supplemental elections procedures related to these provisions. Section two contains the operative provisions of the bill. Uh, I would note that starting in subsection A first, these are temporary provisions that apply to the year 2021. And a second important thing to note about that lead in in subsection A is that it is setting aside any law to the contrary. And a point of confusion that has come up is that this applies additionally to municipal charters. This is setting aside any contrary provision of law that is contained in a municipal charter or general law. 
The first operative provision, a municipal legislative body may vote to move the date of the municipality's 2021 annual meeting to a date later in the year 2021. Second, that the legislative body may require the clerk to mail out ballots to all active registered voters in the municipality for the annual meeting. The third piece here is specific to the town of Brattleboro. The town of Brattleboro is the only municipality in the state that holds its annual meeting as a representative annual town meeting. And subdivision three here permits them to do so through electronic means in 2021. The fourth subdivision uh, provides authority to the Secretary of State to permit as applicable alternative elections procedures that supplement and relate to any municipal authority under this subsection. So again, it allows them to supplement and permit alternative procedures relating to these subdivisions and the authority contained within. Um, some examples to help clarify what that might be. And of course, this does not mean that they will be used, but they are examples that may have come up in the past. Creating ballot collection stations, allowing clerks to begin counting ballots in a window preceding the annual meeting, or potentially permitting drive-through collection of ballots. These are some of the uh, supplemental procedures we're talking about. Subsection B, we have a bit of a saving clause here. In any municipality that moves the date of their 2021 annual meeting, municipal officers that are currently in office shall serve until the annual meeting and until successors are chosen. This makes sure that no terms will expire if the municipality moves their annual meeting date to later in the year. And for some reason, there is a charter provision or a piece of general law that specifies a specific date when officers shall take office. And an example of that uh, that co comes to mind whenever this is discussed is that all uh, officers of an incorporated school district are uh, mandated to assume their positions on July 1st. It's very specific. Subsection C uh, provides that uh, for any election procedure that the Secretary of State orders or permits under the section that the Secretary shall also adopt corresponding procedures that ensure that the public can monitor polling places and the counting of votes. I have to stop sharing here so that I can click on the next tab. Give me one moment. Are there any questions that have come up so far? Uh, I've lulled you all into a false sense of security. Representative Higley has a question. Yeah, and again, uh, you know, I haven't been involved uh, with this uh, bill up to this point, but um, one of the questions I've got is when it talks about allowing the municipalities the, uh, the time to move the date later in the year, is there, a, is there an end date to this? Is there, is there a must stop date to this, which I don't see in the bill? H48 does not contain a deadline or a must stop date, as you put it. Uh, that was discussed during the early discussions around this bill. And ultimately the decision was made to leave as much freedom as possible with the understanding that there are very serious practical limitations on how far out a municipality can push this. So there are a lot of other deadlines associated with the annual meeting date that will not be extended. And some of the more serious ones that were discussed early on are those related to uh, education property tax liabilities to the state. Okay, thank you. Uh, I guess if I could follow up, maybe, um, uh, so is there, is there gonna be any word that goes out to uh, municipal elected officials regarding that saying that, you know, you need to make sure that you understand there are uh, other dates that are critical in, in your making a decision as to when to hold your, your uh, uh, town meeting. 
H48 does not direct any state agency or group to put out that word, but you do have quite a few uh, groups in our virtual room right now who could potentially do that and you could coordinate with them. Okay, thank you. I think that would be very important because my select boards are, are pretty much up in the air as to uh, what's being considered or what they can and can't do. And uh, anyway, I think that would be helpful. Thank you. So I'll move through uh, a set of frequently asked questions that we put together. Um, Tucker, can I just inter interrupt of... you for a moment to yes. say that um, Mike Merwicki has his hand up? Was that a cue for me to ask my question, Madam Chair? Well, you have your hand up, so I wanted to make All sure right, we called you. on you. And um, Rep Higley, if you're done, would you lower your hand? Sure. Um, not sure if this is the time, but it's a question I raised uh, yesterday that at least I want to put in a parking lot here. Um, what I'm hearing from the three towns I represent is that there's confusion uh, about the idea of needing signatures to get a ballot question on the town meeting warning, not for candidates, but for instance, should this or that nonprofit uh, be allowed to operate uh, as an, uh, without paying tax for the year? Or should this question be put to the voters about whether the town supports an idea? Uh, in the past, they've had to get an X amount of signatures and um, my understanding from last session was that this had been waived and that select boards do have that, um, but I'm not clear about that and I'm looking for clarity. I see Jim Conda shaking his head. Um, I'm, I'm looking for clarity that I can bring back to my select boards uh, on this concern. So uh, thank you for putting that in the parking lot. Uh, I will meet you there. It is the last question in the frequently asked questions document, but I will quickly note that what was waived in Act 162 was signature requirements for candidates for local office. There has been no waiver of signature requirements for petitioning an article to be added to the warning at the annual meeting those signature requirements remain in place. However, there are other avenues for an article to be put on the local ballot. And when we get to the bottom of the FAQ, we can discuss that. And I'm assuming that there will be lots of input from uh, others who are with us. Uh, the first frequently asked question that came up, which is, which municipalities are authorized to use these alternative annual meeting procedures? Uh, so the bill authorizes broadly municipalities through their municipal legislative body to use the alternative procedures in the bill. The general definition of a municipality includes a city, a town, town school district, incorporated school or fire district or incorporated village, and all other governmental incorporated units. So we can say broadly that any incorporated unit of local government has the authority to use these alternative annual meeting procedures. If a municipal legislative body votes to move the date of the annual meeting, is there any requirement for a meeting to be held on the first Tuesday in March? So this question did come up a surprising amount. If we vote to move the annual date, do we still have to meet on the first Tuesday in March and do something, whether that is open a meeting and then hold any questions in the meeting until the later date? The answer is that the temporary authority that is provided here does not require uh, the legislative body or the voters to gather on the first Tuesday of March if it has been extended to a later date. No need to meet. Does the bill automatically extend other municipal deadlines? And there is a two part answer to this. First, if the municipal legislative body votes to move the annual meeting date, 
deadlines that are tied directly to the annual meeting date will be adjusted as well. And an example of a deadline that is tied directly to the annual meeting date is 24 VSA section 1681A1, which requires town and auditors to meet 25 days before each annual town meeting to examine and adjust the accounts of all town officers. If the annual meeting date is moved to a date later in the year, the auditors would be required to meet 25 days before that later date. This deadline moves with the annual meeting date. It is not likely that age 48 will extend or suspend municipal deadlines that have specific dates established by statute and that do not directly reference the annual meeting date. As an example, 32 VSA section 5402 sub B3 automatically triggers the calculation of an interim homestead education tax rate if a district has not voted a budget by June 30th. That June 30th specific deadline is set and this bill would not extend that express deadline. Who is responsible for holding the annual meeting and budget vote of an incorporated district if the member municipalities have different annual meeting dates? This was the most frequently asked question. In general, the district is responsible for conducting its own annual meeting and administering a district election or budget vote. And this answer is gonna be a bit general because we have many kinds of districts in Vermont. In prior years, incorporated districts have been able to coordinate with their member municipalities to administer district elections or budget votes on their statutory annual meeting date. Under the temporary provisions in H48, member municipalities uh, may have different annual meeting dates. Municipalities are gonna be able to set their own uh, meeting date. It's gonna be a decision that may end up staggering the meeting dates of member municipalities. Unless general law directs municipal officers to assist an incorporated district with all or part of an annual meeting or budget vote, the incorporated district and its officers are responsible for conducting the meeting and the vote throughout the district. So it falls to the district and the district officers unless there is something else that directs municipal officers to assist. Is there a deadline by which a municipal legislative body must vote to apply the Australian ballot system to the annual meeting? So under Act 162, any municipal legislative body can vote to apply the Australian ballot system to its meeting. Neither H48, what you have in front of you, or Act 162 contain a deadline for the vote of the legislative body. However, general law sets the deadlines for the preparation of local election ballots. And an example of one of those deadlines, 17 VSA 2681A, requires that local ballots shall be prepared not later than 20 days before the local election. Uh, if you want an idea of the scheme of deadlines associated with ballot preparation, I encourage you to ask those that are here from the Secretary of State's office. Does H48 suspend signature requirements for petitioned annual meeting articles? No, H48 does not suspend signature requirements for those articles that are set by 17 VSA section 2642A3A. However, any voter may ask the legislative body of a municipality to place an article on the warning on the legislative body's own motion. The legislative body of a municipality has the authority to add an article on its own motion to the warning. Uh, that is one of the avenues that is available. Uh, there was discussion around potential conflicts of law here tension between the potential inability to gather to collect signatures and the requirement in place for wet ink, as we call it, physical signatures on petitions. Um, throughout those discussions, uh, it became clear that there were um, voters and groups in municipalities that had come up with uh, alternative ways to collect signatures, mailing out petitions, posting petitions, um, and that 
in many municipalities, it was the case that the legislative body was going to, on its own motion, add articles to the ballot. H48 uh, does not contain a waiver of the petition signature requirements. That is all I have, unless you have more questions. Thank you for listening to my monotone for so long. I'm sure it's a great way to start the session. It feels like we never left. Thank you, Tucker. Um, Samantha Lefebvre has a question. So I'm not sure if this is also the right spot to ask, but um, a couple of my towns all have the same questions. Um, so the first one would be is if, you know, this goes out, would the Secretary of State be able to override um, what the town wants to do? It would, would that be part of um, that the Secretary of State has the power to, you know, change some of the stuff? And then also, um, is in-person voting or gathering going to be forbidden if this is passed? Um, and then is there a penalty or what would the penalty be if the town does not comply? Sorry, I had to take a second to write down the questions. Uh, I'll start with the um, Secretary of State piece. The powers that are being granted the Secretary of State to are to supplement the alternative procedures here. So essentially to support them. There is not authority within that subdivision for the Secretary of State to override or suspend the authority that is being granted to municipal governments. Um, second, can you repeat the question about in-person voting? If this is successfully passed, will um, in-person voting be forbidden? So, or gathering. So I know the town of Orange does all floor votes. Um, and, like, and so would they be forbidden for gathering? No, they would not be forbidden uh, unless there is an ongoing prohibition on some sort of large gatherings. Uh, the purpose of one of the powers that's being granted here is to allow the municipality to move their annual meeting date to a later date in the year when it may be safe for people to gather and hold their floor votes. If you go back to the um, purpose and intent section, one of the things that's covered there is that the General Assembly is acknowledging that there are many municipalities that want to continue their practice and custom of meeting in person and holding floor votes. So that's one of the interests that the General Assembly is trying to protect here. And uh, you asked, what is the penalty for, what's the um, non-compliance like that you're concerned didn't... with? If they didn't, I think it was more of if the Secretary of State could say, you know, could shut down, like, let's say they wanted to remain in person. Um, is there a penalty if that does occur? Um, I guess they, I guess I should have asked more clarification, but I think they were going off of the basis. If it was forbidden to meet in person, what is the penalty for them if they do so? Well, moving away from, you know, we resolved in the, the answer to the first question uh, that the Secretary of State, under the provisions of this bill, doesn't have authority to override the municipality's decision. I'll highlight, um, it's not a penalty, but it is a risk. One of the risks of not appropriately conducting your annual meeting is that you could have a challenge to one of the votes or decisions that's made. So that's something that municipalities always have to be aware of. And here, when they're choosing what they're going to do for this particular, particular annual meeting, something they may want to pay more attention to. Um, and you have the Secretary of State's office in the room. I'm sure you could speak with them, connect them with your municipalities, and uh, try to figure out a safe, non-risky path. And since we haven't had an opportunity to, to really do some of that baseline um, committee testimony about how all of these parts fit together, um, I, I think I would just ask Tucker for clarification that a, a challenge to, um, to a, a meeting that was held um, perhaps in person when, when there was a state of emergency would be made by a citizen of that town. It's not something that 
uh, that necessarily a state entity would, uh, would be able to do. I would say that would be the most likely source of a challenge. Yes. Great. Anyone else have questions for Tucker on either the FAQ sheet or the bill language? All right, feel free to put your hand up if you do. Um, and I'm gonna go now to Secretary of State Jim Condos. Thank you for being with us. Um, thank you also for uh, spending time and, and uh, bringing your staff members with us so that we could uh, develop the language uh, in order to allow municipalities to safely hold their annual meetings. So share your thoughts, please. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Copeland Hansis. Uh, with me today is uh, Will Senning, our Director of Elections, um, and Chris Winters, the Deputy Secretary of State. Um, I will be brief and, and then I have to get off because I've got another uh, call that I have to make. So I'll let them pick up where I leave off. Uh, first of all, let, let's just back up a little bit for a little bit of background here. Act 92 and 135 were the, the two acts uh, last year uh, in the spring that allowed the Secretary of State's office to uh, adjust uh, as we went forward with the election season, recognizing that we had the election. And I think at that time, nobody thought that this would go beyond the end of the year. Um, but I think what, what's happened since that, and by the way, we had two overarching goals that we were following. And some of you have heard me say this before, but the two overarching goals were one, to uh, ensure that we protected Vermonters right to vote, and two, to protect the health and safety of not only our voters, but also our uh, town clerks and our uh, uh, volunteers who help at, at the polls our poll workers. So those were the two premises that we used uh, for every decision that we made. Um, as the year went on, uh, and, and frankly, it was a very successful election. It was probably our one of our safest and most secure elections that we've ever held. Uh, we had a lot of work that we put into it. Uh, literally, we Vermont has the smallest elections team in the country. Uh, we have five people in our elections team. Uh, and I think uh, my deputy, myself, and chief of staff were made honorary members of, of the elections team because we were literally working six and seven days a week, 10, 12 hours a day, starting back in April right through to November, and actually since November. Uh, this has not ended for us. Um, going forward, we've had many discussions uh, with VLCT, with town clerks, with uh, legislative leaders, with the administration about what do we do about town meeting day. Now, of course, you guys in Act 162 did, or the previous legislature did uh, take care of signature verification, or signature, I'm sorry, signature requirements for candidates and not for uh, articles of, of uh, for the ballot. Uh, and, and that was determined because uh, there was already law that allowed for that to occur. So we've, we've got these pieces in place, but what we didn't do um, and through no fault of anybody is, is decide what to do with town meeting day as it, as it started to fast approach. So I'm, I'm just gonna give you some quick dates. Town meeting day is March 2nd. We have to do a lot of this stuff before that time, the deadlines come upon us very quickly. For instance, ballots have to be prepared by the towns by Wednesday, February 10th. That's in statute. The warning has to be published by January 31st. That's the end of this month. Candidates filing to get on the ballot have to be, have to file by January 25th. Um, and the last item is the article petition filing. So if there's an article that wants to be added to uh, the ballot, that is January 14th. Well, that's next week's folks. And we knew, we recognized uh, as we were discussing this with uh, Tucker, uh, with, with uh, legislative leaders, with the administration, 
And we didn't have a lot of time, so we had to come up with a bill as quickly as possible that would be as brief as possible to try to get something through that we could all agree on so that we could move it as quickly as, as, as we can. This literally has to be on the governor's desk sometime next week. Uh, and we took steps um, as, as uh, Representative Copeland Hansis is aware, we took steps to add uh, some funding uh, for reimbursements to towns. Uh, the Joint Fiscal Committee uh, just this week uh, met and approved $2 million to come to our office uh, that was supported by VLCT, by legislative leaders, uh, by the town clerks to help us reimburse town clerks uh, and, and, their, and the various towns and entities around the, around the state. Um, the original ask after uh, much discussion was of 1.5 million. The Joint Fiscal Committee felt it was, a, it was prudent on their part to add an additional 500,000. So we now have $2 million that have been deposited uh, from CARES Act money, CRF money, uh, to ensure that we have the funding available. I'm going to tell you, we don't know if that's enough. Um, but if we had added money into this bill, then it would have had to make at least two more stops. It would have had to gone to have gone to the appropriations committees in both House and Senate. Uh, so it would have held up the, the ability of this bill to uh, move forward uh, in a timely manner. We are ready to uh, take this upon ourselves to uh, work to uh, meet the requirements that the towns have. Uh, obviously, probably the best solution is to move town meeting day further out to provide a little more funding uh, time timeline for the towns. But we know that that's not going to happen across the state. I also want to bring up the different types of uh, Tucker did start to bring up the types of, of districts that are out there or what we call municipalities. Uh, it, you have town and cities uh, departments, you have school districts, you have water, sewer, even waste districts. Some of those are local, some of those are multi town. Uh, and, and for instance, with some of the waste districts, it could be 40 to almost 50 towns in a waste district. So the, what, what we are going to encourage, um, I don't know that we can mandate it, but uh, we, we are certainly going to encourage uh, all these municipal entities that want to take advantage of this to try to consolidate and coordinate their deadlines and their, and their, their ballot questions so that they can be on one ballot. If we have 14 school, uh, uh, school districts and uh, all the towns in, in the state and then we have uh, solid waste districts and water and sewer districts because they're multi-town start to want to do this on their own. We're out of money. We won't have enough. Um, so it's going to be imperative that, that uh, all these different municipal districts uh, try to coordinate and, and bring their, their votes together. Uh, I, I was a former uh, solid waste district representative uh, and actually vice chair for uh, the Chittenden Solid Waste District. Uh, we had 18 towns uh, in our district um, and we always put it so that we could have one vote, um, one ballot question on, on the individual ballots. Um, just trying to think what else, our office, and I think that you've got a couple of town clerks on this call as well, but our office does not have administrative responsibility over cities and towns or any of these municipal districts. Our office just provides advice. We provide uh, interpretations of law. We let them know what, what the requirements are. Uh, and that really is, is the extent of it. Um, and so we're actually taking a further step here. Uh, and, and there is no authority at the Secretary of State's office that oversees uh, and regulates the cities, towns, and municipal districts. So with that, uh, I'll entertain any quick questions. Um, uh, I think, uh, Representative Mariki, your, your question about articles uh, uh, for the ballot, um, it's one that we've, we've had. Um, 
There are other options. There are also options that someone, in order to get those wet signatures, that they could email out a uh, petition to a, a list of, of folks uh, and have them sign it and then mail it back in or drop it off uh, to get the required number of signatures. And I, I don't know what the size of your towns are, but uh, I know there are some towns where in order to get a ballot question, they only need, they need less than 100 signatures. So I think, I, I think there's ways to get to that. Um, we're not ready to take this to the next step where we allow for electronic signatures. Uh, that starts to bring us into a different uh, realm and a, and a different area of possibilities that have to be looked at, requirements, basically. So I'll stop there, answer any questions, and, and then I'm going to have to go, and Chris and Will can uh, fill you in from there. Thank you, Secretary Condos. I don't see, um, oh, I see uh, Rep Merwicki, uh, but I just want to remind folks that we do have some committee members who need to go to caucus at this moment. So if it's a quick question, go ahead, and otherwise we'll come back to it at one o'clock. All right, yeah, it Mike's. Could be a question for Tucker too. Is this session law or will this go in the green books? This is session law. All right. Uh, thank you all for your flexibility this morning. I apologize for the uh, for the up and down, but uh, it's the nature of the business. And um, we will see you all back here at one. The same Zoom meeting invitation that got you in here will get you back at one o'clock and we'll pick up where we left off. Thank you.